Hi everyone, I wanted to make a video to show people how I do EEP emulation inside of my labs. I'm releasing a workbook on SD access and I'm going to be using this method in the workbook to allow people to test out ICE and SGTs in TrustSec. And when I see people normally do labs about EEP related things, I see them uh, create custom node definitions for Windows OSs. Sometimes they'll use Windows 7 because it's a little bit light more lightweight than Windows 10. Um, I also see people use desktop OSs so that they have a GUI to fill out the EEP details. In this video, we're going to be doing it fully command line and we're going to be using a, a built-in node definition inside of CML. So it's really lightweight. There are a few gotchas and a few restrictions, um, which is why I wanted to make this video so that if people are doing my workbook and they've never done this before, they've never used Linux before, they have something to watch somebody do it in. So hopefully it's a little easier. Um, so on my screen, I have the beta topology for my workbook. Um, at the end here, these are the client devices. So these are the, in this instance, they're SD access clients, but it, it really doesn't matter what type of clients they are. What I did was I wiped this first, this first node here. Um, so these are the, the, it's a built in node definition. It's Ubuntu. Um, and if, I think you can hover here, maybe. Okay, yeah, so it's two gigs of RAM, one vCPU. Um, it says you can use cloud in it. My original plan for this was to generate a custom cloud in it file that installed the supplicant software. And then I was just gonna publish that. Unfortunately, that would be harder than just asking people to do it because of the way cloud in it works the initialization of the supplicant software wouldn't have been in the user data file, which is what CML mounts to do cloud in it. So this way is actually, I think a little easier unless you wanted to share custom node definitions with that. I, I think just gets messy because not everybody knows how to use them. Um, but this is a, a very basic, this was just reset. So there's nothing on workstation one aside from, you know, what comes with the node definition. The, this is the special part here. So this is an external connector that's in bridge mode. Um, and then this is just a layer two switch. There's actually no configuration on the switch, just a layer two switch. Um, and this is connected to the first ethernet port on workstation one. The reason I use the first ethernet port on workstation one, and actually all these workstations, is because the first ethernet port has DHCP enabled by default. It's DHCP client by default, at least in the uh, install that CML gives you. So if I actually look, I should have a DHCP address on ENS2, which I do not. So let me do something. So I'm just gonna shut, no shut the interface. I did just reset this before the video. This doesn't work i'll wipe the node again sometimes my dhcp server is weird my dhcp server is cisco and they do something weird with like the client id so if you wipe the node but you don't give it a new mac address it gets a little weird i'm gonna wipe this again and then i'll be back okay so now i actually have an ip address on workstation one that can access the internet there's some ways around this i know some people really don't like their labs touching the internet you can actually download the WPA supplicants uh, dev package and you could host it somewhere locally and then transfer it into the machines. Um, there's, there's a few other ways around it. It just doesn't come with any of the predefined node definitions that I can find, at least the Ubuntu one, which I think is the easiest one to use as a WPA supplicant. So the first thing you need to do is when, when you get internet access, so this, this has internet access, we can verify Yep, so we have internet access. And like I said, that what you what I've done and what I've found is easiest is adding more interfaces to the, the Ubuntu node and then connecting that first one to your internet connection. So now that we know we have internet, we should be able to do an apt update, which is required to pull the sources in from um, from the cloud. Sometimes when you install Ubuntu, it's part of the installation process. 
But since the node definitions are sort of normalized or whatever the Linux equivalent of sysprept is, um, there's no there's no repo stuff at all. So you have to do an update and it's actually really slow. Um, but when this finishes, I'll cut through it and then we'll run the next command. Okay, now that our sources are updated, we can actually pull the package we need. So the command is sudo apt install uh, wpa supplicant. The gotcha here is that when you run the command, that's the syntax. But when you pull the software down from apt, it's all one word. This actually doesn't take as long. I don't even think I'll need to cut here. It's really small. It's like 4,000, 5,000 kilobytes. Um, so this should finish right, right now. When this finishes, it'll create a directory in Etsy um, called WPA supplicant. Unfortunately, they don't really give you um, any bootstrap config for what we're doing. So we pretty much need to create that ourselves. So you can use VI or nano. I usually name it. I think the, the like the standard name is WPA underscore supplicant dot conf. Um, when you create this, you have to be sudo because you're in Etsy. Also, if you start Googling this, it'll get weird because a lot of times WPA supplicant is sort of instantiated by another um, another Linux networking feature like NetPlan or something. Here, we're going to be manually calling WPA supplicant. The advantage to doing that and not running it as something like a daemon or instantiating it from a service is we see all the logs printed right to the, the terminal. Um, the disadvantage of that is it's not going to automatically authenticate you when you join a network. It's not going to be listening for like EPOL start messages or anything like that. It's going to make you instantiate the program to start that process. I think that's amazing for a lab because it lets you see everything. Um, but we'll see that when we get there. So this uh, config that I'm posting in, I will put on uh, on my GitHub and link it in the description. It's not very easy to find because a lot of the examples you'll find will be for Wi-Fi. Um, and even if they're not for Wi-Fi, they won't be using peep. And if you don't use peep, it gets really complicated. Um, I think this is pretty much what we need. Let me, Vim gets really weird when you run it inside of CML. So I just want to make sure that I actually pasted correctly. Yeah, okay, so this is pretty much what you're doing. I don't even think, you definitely don't need some of this. Like that's for Wi-Fi, that's for Wi-Fi. This is the important stuff. So we're using peep here. Um, I'm using peep because it's enabled in ICE by default and it doesn't require like, it requires minimal certificate stuff. The nice thing about the WPA supplicant software and the commands that we're running, it's gonna automatically trust the self-signed certificate from ICE. In a lab environment, that's really nice because you don't have to worry about installing a CA cert on your workstations. But this is pretty much the, the minimum config. Once you have that configuration there, this, this is where uh, you can shut down this side of the network because you've already installed the supplicant software. So now you can break the connection to the internet. It doesn't matter. Um, what I usually do is uh, like sudo IP link set ENS two down and then I'll set ENS three up and then I'll add an IP address because my fabric above this doesn't have DHCP so for testing we'll just add an IP address uh, 10254 100 hold on let me get this all in one line Vim messed up my my console here okay when you're adding an IP address in Linux, make sure you put a uh, subnet mask on it. If you don't put a subnet mask on it, it defaults to a slash 32, and then everything looks right, except you can't ping because it's like a slash 32 stub loopback network thing. So just make sure you put a mask there or you have to remove it and add it again. Um, device ENS3 is the one facing the fabric. Okay, and then sudo IP route. Not that the fabric has internet, but if I don't do this now, we'll come back to it later and forget I didn't do this. Make sure that looks right. Okay, so now if we take a look. ENS2 is down. 
ENS3 is up. So we've essentially turned this link off. We brought it down. We brought the link facing. Um, this is a virtual Catalyst 9000 switch. So we brought, I'm actually going to console into that. We brought that up. If we do, I think it's actually right here. Yeah. Show. So if we do a show access session, we should see unauthorized everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So right now the access session is unauthorized um, because even though we have that config file, we haven't told it to authenticate. So there's another command and I'm not going to type this out because I will mess it up. This one will be on GitHub as well. Um, that's the command. So basically, like I said, there's an underscore here. That's the gotcha. There's an underscore there when you call WPA supplicant. Um, and then there's an explicit path to the config file. I mean, technically you don't need the explicit path because we're in the folder, but I have the explicit path there anyway, in case you've changed directories since you've installed the config file. Uh, the device is wired and the interface is ENS3. So you just have to change ENS3 to whatever your switch facing interface is. Once we start this, this is why I really, really like this over Windows. You can really see how verbose this is and how it's telling you everything it's doing. Here we can see the name of our NAC server, yt-ice, because it's pulling it out of the certificate. And you can see that authentication completed successfully. Earlier today, I had some password issues, and it was so obvious to me what the issue was because of these messages. If I would have went through all the time to put Windows node definitions in, and was running four Windows 7 machines here, or Windows 10 machines, first of all, I would be using three times the resources. Second of all, I would not have seen, I would have had to dig through Event Viewer or dig through ICE Live Logs. So I think that alone is a big advantage. Let's find the session here. Yep, so status authorized, and the username is Bob, which is the username from our config file, if I could find it. Yeah, right here. So once you authenticate, you can control C out of that, that process. I actually think if you let it sit there long enough, it will cancel you out of it. But you don't need to sit in there. But like I said, if I were to shut down the switch interface, I would have to run that command again because we haven't daemonized it. It's not, it's not running in the background and constantly listening. But I still think, like I said, for a lab, this is still really good. I'm running this on all these four workstations. They're pushing up against these two Catalyst 9000 series switches. And then I have ICE sitting up here, which is the NAC. So if you're following along with my workbook, this lab might look a little different when I publish it, but this is going to be the gist of the workstation configuration task. The reason I'm making a video for this first, as opposed to the other tasks, is because the other tasks are all, I would consider networking tasks. They're all tasks that if you're doing the workbook, you probably want to figure them out on your own and learn them. But this is not really a networking thing. It's just a nuance of virtualizing everything and having to do all this stuff inside a CML where you don't necessarily have your normal endpoint OS is available to you. So this has been a really short video, but I think it really, I got, I captured the essence of what I wanted to show people. I'm going to have, so all this stuff, I might put it on a separate GitHub or I might just put it on the GitHub with my workbook, but I'll put it in a separate folder. If you have questions, feel free to reach out, um, especially about the SD access workbook. But even if you're just trying to do like an ice proof of concept or something, I've done this a few times for that and it's worked really well. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me in the comments or on my blog. And I hope you really gain something from this video.